It's in your name we pray, Jesus. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Thanks, Brad. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Brad. Uh, hey, Jesus Christ brings us! Yeah. Jesus Christ brings us! Yeah. Yes! Amen! I, it's a little awkward being the, the opening night speaker at a, a, a conference because, like, it's opening night. You're supposed to be funny and make jokes, and I don't have any jokes. And it's opening night. You're supposed to entertain. And, uh, yeah, I could juggle. I do juggle. I could entertain. Um, but I just, I don't want to, I don't want to just tickle your ears tonight. I don't want to tell jokes and, um, and, uh, and entertain. I just want to jump right into the fullness of the conference, right? Like, because we can get, we don't have to wait till night two or night three for the heavens uh, to shake the earth. It can happen tonight, right? And the Lord wants to bless us with the full gospel message and an experience of the full gospel taking place in our lives right here tonight. Amen? And this is the good news of the gospel. The entire gospel can be summarized in this, that Jesus Christ has come to free us from the bondage of slavery and sin and death and to bring us into an experience of the promised land that the Father has bestowed on us from the very moment of creation. Amen? Amen. That brothers and sisters, tonight, as we speak the gospel, the bondage of slavery can fall off of you. I've seen it happen that as I proclaim the word of God, the chains that hold you down can literally fall off of your body. As I proclaim the promises of the Father, the spirits that have been weighing on you, those darknesses that have been plaguing you for years, can be lifted off of your shoulder and go to the foot of the cross where they were defeated once and all for your victory. Amen? Amen. That Jesus Christ has come not just so you could be freed from death, not just so you could be freed from sin, but so that you could experience the fullness and the abundance of heaven, the fullness of life here and now, that heaven can taste, uh, the earth can taste heaven, and, and our experience of worship together as a body can be a foretaste and a sharing in the divine nature of God that we can actually share in heaven tonight. Do you guys believe that, yes or no? I believe it. That's the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. St. Paul was trying to figure out, how do I communicate the gospel to the Galatians? And he says, my brothers and sisters, you're no longer slaves, but you're children of God. And if you're sons and daughters of God, then you're also heirs. This is the good news, that you are no longer a slave. You're not a slave to fear any longer. You are not a slave. It's not your identity. You're not a slave to anxiety or to darkness or to brokenness. You're not a slave to your sins. You're not a slave to your past mistakes. You're not a slave to the opinions of others. You're set free from the opinions of other people. And there's people who are here tonight that have come and there's something inside of you welling up like, ah, dang it, I want to live this life that I've wanted to live, but, it, but there's people in my life telling me not to live it. Or there's these opinions of my friends or my parents with good intentions telling me not to go all in, not to sell 100%, not to cast my nets down and to follow Jesus Christ with all of my life, with all of my heart, my soul, and my passion. And the good news is you're not a slave to those opinions. You are a child of God. And as God's child, you experience his providence. Right before Paul tells the Galatians that they're children of God, he says, the son of God came and the son of God gave you his own spirit that allows you to cry out, Abba, Father. If you're a son, if you're a daughter, and the spirit of God allows you to cry, Abba, those words are so good. Because those are words of total and complete freedom and dependency. That when I'm a child and I cry out to my dad, daddy, it says, I know you're going to provide for me, for my every need, for my every desire, for my every comfort. You will nourish me. You will guide me. You will instruct me. You will show me my way. You will help me grow up strong. Why? Because you are my Abba. That you're no longer a slave. But your children, your children of the Father, and we have a good Father. Jesus says, What father would give their son 
a snake when they ask for fish? Or what father would give their daughter a rock when they ask for a loaf of bread? I'll tell you what kind of a dad would do that. A bad dad. But we have a good father, yes or no? Yes, amen. That we're no longer slaves, but we're children. And here's the best news of all. If we're children, then we're heirs, amen? Amen. And guys, I just want a renewal of your mind right now. That if we're heirs to the kingdom of God, that means we have access, legal access. An heir is one with legal permission, legal access to their father's inheritance. So we are heirs to the king of kings and to the Lord of lords. So we have legal permission and legal access to the abundance and the treasures and the inheritance of heaven. If we, like our kingdom has roads paved with gold. Our kingdom has every need and every desire richly accounted for. That as heirs to the kingdom of God, you, I, we have access to everything in the kingdom. And we don't have to die to experience the promised land. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus died so that you could experience it now. Amen? Amen. And so we don't want to buy into a false gospel that says that Jesus wants us to suffer and suffer and suffer because he already suffered so that we could be set free. He already suffered so that we could experience the fullness of the kingdom here and now. That we are heirs to his kingdom. (laughs) And what is the treasure in the kingdom? St. Paul tells us it's peace, it's love, it's joy, it's gentleness, it's generosity, it's faithfulness, it's kindness, it's self-control. That all the things that you're hungry for in life, you have a legal right to them. That as sons of God, you can lay claim to the peace of heaven in your life. As daughters of God, you can lay claim to the joy of heaven in your life. As sons of God, you can lay claim to the self-control of heaven in your life. That is good news, and that is the gospel. Peter, he tells his people in 2 Peter, he says... He says that he, God, has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape from the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. So God has given us these great and precious promises and these promises of peace, love, joy, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, generosity, and self-control. They are those things that enable us to share in his divine nature and to escape the corruption of this world. So what's Peter say? If this is the reality, then let us make every effort to respond to God's promises. Brothers and sisters, on this conference, let us make every effort to respond to God's promises. I want to see us cry out. I want to see us beg and yearn for and cry to the Father that he would give us and he would fulfill his promises in our life. Let us make every effort that these promises would come about that we have a good father who has made promises to us and he is faithful and he will fulfill them. I just want to start this conference by speaking the promises of God the Father over us. And as I speak these promises, if it's a promise you need to lay hold of, just allow the lie to fall off of your shoulders and say, that promise is for me. Amen? Amen. Guys, God promised to be with you. He said, I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God promises to take care of all of your needs. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. God promises that he has good plans for your life. For I know well the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for woe. Plans for a future full of hope. God promises to give you rest. Then Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Just receive the rest. God promises to work everything out for your good. And we know that God causes everything 
to work together for the good of those who love him. God promises forgiveness from sin, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. God promises us freedom from those sins. So if Jesus, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. God promises to answer your prayers. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. God promises to protect you. The Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. God promises to empower you. I am sending you the promise of the Father, and you will be clothed with power. God promises to lead you. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. God promises that he will use you abundantly in ministry. Amen, amen, I say to you, if you have faith in me, you will not only accomplish the works that I have done, but greater works than these. God promises that you will know his will for your life. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. God promises you an abundant life that the thief comes to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come so you might have life and have it abundantly. God promises you everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. The father wanted his promises to be fulfilled so badly in your life that he gave his only son. Like, I'm like an imperfect dad, like in so many ways, and my love is so imperfect. But I just like, when I think about giving my only son, like to give my son and to watch my son suffer and die and and to be just absolutely destroyed by the wrath of hell, so that the promises of the Father could be fulfilled in your life. It's just an unspeakable, unfathomable love. Lay hold of the promises that the Father has for you because the Son paid the price so that you could experience them. When you deny the promises of the Father, when you doubt the promises of the Father, when you question His goodness or His faithfulness, you make a mockery of His Son's sacrifice. But when you honor the Father and you say, I believe in you because you are a faithful, everlasting God. You are a God who fulfills his promises, a God of love. When you honor the Father, you worship the Son and you experience the gifts of the Spirit. You know, in Scripture, there's over 3,000 promises that the Father makes to his children. So no matter what you're experiencing right now, I can promise you that there's a promise for that. That the Father has thought of you and your current situation. And he says, I have a plan for you right where you're at. I think some of us have probably come here tonight and we're kind of like, we're feeling like we're in the desert place. We're like, man, I I just, I'm so worried and concerned about my future. I'm burdened by the thought of vocational discernment. I don't know where to go, or I don't know if I made a mistake in the past. I don't know if I've made the right choices or if I will make the right choices. I don't know if if I'm in the right degree or if I'm on the path for the right job. I don't know if I'm ever going to be happy or if I'm ever going to be set free. There's some of you who are just here in the desert place, and I just want to speak to you tonight, and I want to encourage you to stop looking at the problem and start looking at the promise that we need to stop looking at the problem in front of us and find the promise that the father has made for that current situation and start professing that promise over your life make it your battle cry make it your canopy because i promise you there is no bondage no slavery no addiction too strong to break you free and to experience the promise of the Father. And I promise you there is no desert place, there is no wandering spirit, there is no loneliness that is bigger than the promise of the Father. That the Father has a plan for you. And there's some of you tonight, and I know you're in this crowd, that you've been crying out, and there is big dreams on your life. 
And like when you hear the word promise, you're like, yeah, man, the Lord has spoken to me in the quiet place, this promise and this promise and this promise. And you're kind of getting restless in the quiet place because you've been crying out. And I saw a guy in his dorm room crying out like, God, I just want more. I want more. I want more. And you've been crying out and you're just waiting for the father's promises to be filled. And I'm here to speak truth to you tonight that it may not come right away. It may not come like instant coffee, but it's coming that the father fulfills all of his promises over your life and he brews it nicely over time. So it tastes so rich. Amen. Because instant coffee is nasty. It's just nasty. It's not even worth it. The father fulfills his promises. I'm a living testament to it, man. I've been crying, like there's so many, like 20 years ago when I started ministry, there were things I was crying for and crying for and crying for. And there were so many deserts I went through and so many battles I had to fight. And I just kept crying and crying. And God is faithful because he has fulfilled and surpassed everything I asked for back then. He has fulfilled and surpassed everything I asked for back then. He has fulfilled and surpassed everything I asked for back then. And today, guess what? I'm not complacent. I'm on my knees asking for more because we worship a God of the more, not a God of the plateau. He is the God of the mountains and he wants you to reach for the mountaintops and to experience all of him that I want us to rethink and recalibrate our minds on what Christianity and what the Christian life should look like. Because it's not a rejection of that which is good. It's not a prescription for the less. It's an invitation to experience the more of God. The the Christian life is about going from one mountain to another mountain. And that we go through deserts and we go through valleys so that we can experience a higher mountaintop. That the Lord wants us to go from glory to glory so that we can taste and see the goodness of the Lord. That God has more for you. That Christianity is all about experiencing the more of God. That when I go to God in prayer, it's so that I can experience more of God. All of heaven is a mystery, which means you'll never be able to quench the fullness of God. You'll just be there experiencing more and more and more for all of eternity. And the good news of that is that heaven never gets boring because you're always diving deeper into the more of the glorious God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Heaven is so so good. (laughs) Guys, God has more for you. He has more for your family. He has more for your university. He has more for your brothers and your sisters. He has more for your friendships. He has more for your teams. He has more for your workplace. He has more for you and for those in your life. Amen? Amen? So my question tonight is, what's keeping us from that more, right? Like, I think I, this image I had for tonight was that we're like right here, like in the desert, and the promised land is right before us. And what is it that's keeping us to experience the more of God? And I just, I think the Lord wants to give us three things tonight, three things to help us experience the more of God. The first thing he wants to give us so that we can experience the promised land is he wants to give us more faith. He wants to give us more faith tonight. Why? Because St. Paul, he told the Hebrews that they could not enter the promised land because of unbelief. That The Israelites, they were trying to enter the promised land, but they couldn't enter the promised land because of unbelief. And so if we want to experience the promised land, we need more faith. We need to conquer unbelief in our life. And we need to experience more faith so that we can experience the more of God. That the Lord wants to pour out faith on us tonight. You know, before Moses died and before Joshua was asked to lead the Israelites into the promised land, Moses called 12 leaders from the 12 tribes. And he asked those 12 leaders to go and to investigate, to be spies, to, to, to look into Cana, Cana and to see the, the, the promised land and to investigate it. And they went for 40 days and these 12 spies, they were there and they grabbed all this fruit from the, the, the promised land and they come back to Moses with a good report and they're like, look at this abundant fruit. This truly is a land flowing with milk and honey. The grapes are the size of watermelons. It's like insane. What, like, 
They're just blown away. And then they say, but the people in those lands are strong. And they said, in their armies, well, their armies have giants. And they said, well, their cities have fortified walls around them. But there's two of the spies, there was ten, there's 12 spies, two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they said, no, no, we can take this city. Let's go in, we can take this land promised for us. And this is what they said, go back to that one slide. They said, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were giants. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So what happens? These spies, they start spreading false lies about the kingdom. They're like, it actually isn't the promised land. The land devours the people. It's not that good. And what happens next, it blows my mind. What happens next is it says, that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fail, fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt, they said to one another. We should choose a leader to take us back. Faith, I mean unbelief, spread like wildfire. That there was 10 leaders who lacked faith. And when they had unbelief and they lacked faith in the promises of God, they spread a false gospel. And when they spread a false gospel, that false gospel crippled the entire land of Israel so that all the people of God lost faith in the promises of God. Hear me now. This is happening in our church today. It's happening in our church today where our leaders who lack faith are spreading a false gospel because they haven't experienced the promises of God in their own life or because they have felt broken and dismayed and they've lost trust in God. They've started preaching a gospel, false gospel and they've stopped proclaiming the promises of the Father. Like how often do we hear a gospel of ex expectation proclaimed in our parishes? We've watered down the gospel and we've made the desert the normal Christian experience as opposed to the promised land. Listen to me, our priests, our religious who are in this room, the church needs you now. You will go through deserts. You will go through valleys. But allow the proclamation of the good news to be good news. That we as a church, we need our leaders to stand firm in the promises of God to share the fullness of the gospel with us, that we have a good father who is with us no matter what, who has conquered the enemy so that we could be set free from bondage, that we can experience the fullness of heaven here and now, that we can experience healing, we can experience deliverance, that there is hope that we can partake in. If you're in campus ministry, don't allow the faithlessness of the leaders above you to stop you from proclaiming the fullness of the gospel. Do you hear me? Yes or no? Yes. We need to speak the fullness of God. We need to proclaim over our universities, over our workplaces, over the darkness of this world, the promises of God. We need more faith, church. We need to be a church who doesn't see the problem but sees the promise. We need to be a people who are so ingrained in the promises of God that when the problem is presented to us, we don't rationalize the problem, we prophesy the promise. Wow. And what did Moses and Aaron do during all of this? It says they fell to the ground and laid their faces to the ground. I don't know, maybe they were like, God help me. Because they're like, give us a new leader. But what Moses and Aaron should have done in that moment is they should have started preaching testimony to what God had done in the past and say, Lord, do it again. 
Because God had already brought them victory over the giants. God had already destroyed the Egyptian army and brought them into freedom. They should have said, God's already done it once. Lord, do it again. The world, the world we need as a people of God when we're in a desert place and we're trying to move to the promised land is to be a people who testify to what God has done and say, Lord, do it again. Lord, we want more. Amen? Amen. Guys, I want to testify to what God did at this conference last year. Last year, oh my gosh, it was so good. I just saw people on their knees weeping and experiencing, not like, oh, I feel so much cotton candy and fuzzballs inside of me. It, it was like people on their knees, like, Lord, I give you everything. I give you everything. I give you everything. The disciples were born last year at this conference, and I say, Lord, do it again. The missionaries were born last year at this conference, and I say, Lord, do it again. I heard multiple people today already share with me last year, this conference changed my life. And I say, Lord, do it again. Yeah. Last year, oh man, last, I, there was someone who testified that their brother came to this conference last year and their brother encountered the power of God and his life was forever changed. Lord, do it again. Yeah. Last year, there was someone who was a non-Catholic and just let's give it up for all of our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Yeah. There was a... There was a non-Catholic here last year who she just like beats me up when it comes to Holy Spirit power. She's like, she experiences the power of God profoundly in her life. And she has this keen sensitivity to the presence of God. And she testified that when the Eucharist came into the room for the first time, the presence of God, that we believe that the bread isn't a symbol, but the bread is the true body, blood, soul, and divinity of God, that the fullness of God is pleased to dwell here on earth, not just in a manger 2,000 years ago, but today in the Holy Eucharist. And she said, when the presence of God came into the room, she felt this, like, this, this elevation of the presence in the room. And because of that, she's like, where else could I go? She entered the church last Easter. Lord, do it again. Let us all experience an elevation of his presence tonight. We need more faith. Caleb... And Joshua, in the faithfulness of the people, they said, it said, then Joshua and Caleb, they tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel. And they said, the land we pass through is an exceedingly good land. They preach the truth. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and he will give it to us. This land which flows with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. They're our bread. We're going to devour them. You know what's really interesting? There's 12 spies who went. 10 of them said, you can't. We don't remember their names. Two of them said, you can. We know their names. If you want your name remembered... Be a person who says you can, not a person who says you can. If you want your name remembered, tell people you can do it. Tell people you can, not you can't. Man, just think about the church. How many times have you, how many times was I, as a young disciple, told you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. That language doesn't belong in the church. Yes, you can. We need to be a people of more faith, amen? amen. <laughs> My own testimony just in that is that, man, about six, seven years ago, I was a part of a charismatic community, and I was part of a charis like I had been part of charismatic communities since my conversion at age 18. And um, I noticed that, that I was hungry for more, and the realities in Scripture that the Holy Spirit had promised us in Scripture, I wasn't experiencing in my own life. We were a charismatic community, and, and we had a lot of praise and worship, um, and, and we, like some people in the community had the gift of tongues, and, and there was this corporate prophecy that sometimes we would share. We would share words for the body, but I didn't see the fullness of the Spirit moving where he was healing the sick and casting out demons and resurrecting the dead, and I wanted to just see the more of God. I started to read the Gospels, and I started to read the Acts of the Apostles, and it was like, Lord, I'd do it again. 
Like, I don't want it to just be Acts chapter 12. I want it to be Acts chapter 2021. And I want it to be my life that I'm experiencing the fullness of the promise. And so I started to go to my leaders of these communities around the country. And I started to ask them, why aren't we experiencing the fullness of the promise of the Holy Spirit? If we're crying out to the Holy Spirit, why aren't we experiencing it? And why are our Protestant brothers and sisters and other denominations experiencing powerful outpourings of the Holy Spirit where signs and wonders, healings and miracles are abounding, and yet the Catholic Church isn't experiencing the fullness of the promise of God? And the leaders, they, they said, well, once you reach a maturity in faith, you realize that sometimes those things don't happen. Well, once they reached a maturity of faith, they plateaued and got complacent, and they chose the desert over the promised land. Brothers and sisters, we are a people of the more. We are a people of the promise. If you haven't seen God do something that he promised, then get on your knees and cry out for him to do it until you experience it. Amen? Amen. Because he's doing it all over the world, and I don't want to miss the boat. I want to be a part of the action. Amen? Amen? We need more faith. Let's just pray right now. Lord, give us more faith. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Let us be a people of more faith so we pass through the desert into the promised land, Lord. That's number one. You guys want to hear number two? Number two is that we need more courage. Someone likes it. The people were intimidated. Oh crap, there's giants. Oh crap, there's fortified cities. The walls are huge. Hear me now. Intimidation is the number one thing I see. Intimidation is the number one thing I see preventing young adults from experiencing the promise of God in their life that you have so much fear of failure and you have so much fear of man. And what you need is to be on your knees and have more fear of God. That when fear of God triumphs over fear of failure and fear of man, then you'll experience the promise of the Father. I know that God plants dreams and passions, these burning desires upon your heart. I know that God puts in your minds a vision for a future full of hope. He puts ideas and insights inside of your minds through the power of his Holy Spirit so you can see his plan for the future. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of prophesy, prophecy working in you to see God's desire for your life and for the world. Don't be intimidated by that. Don't be intimidated by the sacrifice and the hardship and the battles that lie ahead of you in order to lay claim to that promise. You see, faith didn't get the people of God into the promised land. A fight did. You can't just live by faith alone. You need faith and a fight. If you want the promises of God, and if you want the promised land, you have to be a man and a woman filled with faith and a man and a woman filled with a fight. That I don't know why God could have just plundered the enemy with the with the instant thought of his mind, but instead he chose to use the Israelites to go into battle, to wage war, to experience victory in order to take the promised land. We need courage. We need to replace intimidation with courage. In Joshua chapter one, verse three, it says, every place where you set foot, I have given you. Every place where you have set foot, I have given you. You see, claiming the promised land, it's not a one and done thing. It's a lifelong experience. So I claim, when I step into a new experience with God, I claim new territory. And then last year, if you were here, I bet God claimed new territory in your life. And I bet if you were here last year, God's claimed territory in your life because in power isn't God. And this year, God wants you to take another step and claim new territory. That every step we take, we claim new territory. Every step we take, we claim new territory. And with every step we take, there's a new battle to be fought, a new desert that we may experience. 
Have you ever had that experience where it seems like you take new clear, like, territory and you experience the promises of God and you're just like, whoa, total consolation. And then like momentarily, like just moments later, you're like, whoa, total desolation. <laughs> It's because you took over one city and the Lord says, now let's go take the next one. Every step you take is one territory won and he says, now we're gonna go through another desert so you can win more territory. That the Lord doesn't want you to plateau. So he says, there's, there's consolation, there's victory, there's desolation, there's desert, there's consolation, there's victory, there's desolation, there's, de there, there's, there's whatever. It's a process. Why? Because the battle and the desert, it's in the battle and in the desert that we experience the presence and the providence, right? It's in the, it wasn't like they got to the promised land and then they encountered the presence of God. Hear me now. If you're in the desert right now and you're like, man, if only I could get to the promised land, then I can encounter God. No, 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 no. The people encountered God abundantly in the desert. He was all over the place in the desert, like freaking shaking Sinai, like with, with peals of thunder and lightning bolts, right? He's sending bread down from heaven. You're striking a stone and water's flowing forth from it. Like he has this pillar of fire guiding them by light, by night, and a cloud guiding them by day. The presence of God is all over the desert. It's in the desert places that we get on our knees and we cry out in need and in desperation, God, Give me your presence. It's in the desert that we experience the consoling comfort of the presence of God. It's in the battle that we see the miraculous power of the hand of God. You see, in order to make the promised land the promised land, you need the desert in the battle because it wouldn't be that great if you didn't experience the former. So if you find yourself in a desert, or if you find yourself in the battle, don't ask yourself, why has God abandoned me? Instead, ask yourself, where's God in the midst of this battle? Because he's by your side. Amen? Amen. I just want to testify to that. <laughs> Last year, this conference was really sweet, actually, for me. And the Lord... He, he gave me a massive promise over my life during this conference. He's, it, I had been crying out all year, Lord, I just want to love your people better. Spoiler alert, I'm not great at loving people, not like Jesus is, and I just want to love people more. And, uh, and at this conference, I just saw like people like getting rocked by God. And I think it was the third day of the conference. I was in the back of the room and I, I, I just, I received communion. As I was walking back from communion, I saw people who had already received Jesus on their knees, just weeping out of love for him. And I was like, God, you've done so much here. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. And he said, Dan, What I have, the plans I have for this ministry are so much bigger than you could ever imagine. And I fell on the ground and I just started to, to, to experience his power and his presence. And, and that was an exciting promise. I just saw this global promise of a missionary endeavor. But then he made an individual promise and he said, and I'm gonna teach your heart how to love. And it was some of the deepest consolation I've ever experienced. And literally, like the next week, I entered into a season of deep desolation. Where I'd show up to prayer and the consolation just wasn't there. Or when I'd live my ministry life and the evil one would just like fill my mind with doubts and questions and doubts and questions. And it became this constant desert place in prayer and this constant battle with the evil one in my mind. And at first, it was so frustrating and agonizing. But as I look back at the last year and I look back to find the presence of God in the midst of that desert and the presence of God and the providence of God in the midst of that battle, I've come to realize that it was that desert 
And it was that battle that was unveiling things in my heart that needed to be healed, that needed to be exposed, that needed to be brought to the Lord in desperation so that the promise of enabling my heart to love more fully like he loves to be fulfilled. When we experience the desert, don't be dismayed. Look for the presence of God there. Because he's using that experience to fulfill a promise in your life. Amen? Amen. We need more courage. All right, last thing. Number three. Say number three. three. We need more confidence. (laughs) Guys, this blows my mind. Listen to what these dumb spies, listen to what the spies say. (laughs) When they're speaking their false gospel, they say, there we saw giants. And we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we are in their sight. You see, how you see yourself will determine how the enemy sees you. (laughs) Okay, guys. How you see yourself will determine how the enemy sees you. If you're a grasshopper and the enemy's a giant, well, then you're a grasshopper and the enemy's a giant. But if the enemy is an ant and you're a roaring lion, well, then the enemy is truly an ant and you're truly a roaring lion. Your identity will manifest your destiny. That when you know who you are as sons and daughters of God and you know the power you have, that is how you manifest the destiny and the promise of God in your own life. You are not a grasshopper. That's the good news of the gospel. That Jesus Christ didn't come and suffer and die for a bunch of grasshoppers. He came and he suffered and died and filled you with the power of the Holy Spirit so that you could be divine partakers of the the mission and the victory of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to demolish strongholds. And the good news of the gospel is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead was given to you through the Holy Spirit. That you are victorious. That you are a warrior. That you are are, are a glorious, triumphant king. Thank you, Jesus. Look at the scripture here. It's plural. And I think this is so important. He says, they say, we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. We are like grasshoppers in our own sight. It matters how you view the people that God has placed around you. If you see the people around you as insignificant, I don't think you'll experience a promised land. You see, the, when these 12 spies whose names have been forgotten in human history, when they looked at the people of God, the chosen people of God, what they saw were failures. What they saw were grasshoppers. They saw insignificant men and women who couldn't fight an army of giants. But Joshua, Caleb, he's like, I know you're all like saying it would have been better if we just died in Egypt. But Joshua and Caleb, he didn't look at their current state. They, they, they saw the promise of God on the people of God. They actually had God's eyes for God's people. That even though the people of God at that moment were not a powerful army of revivalists, they saw the army of the Lord of revivalists. How you see the students on your campus matters. Because if you see them as insignificant, you'll minister to them like they're insignificant. And if you see yourself as a failure and you see those on your ministry team as failures, you'll minister to people and you'll raise up people who think they're failures. But if you minister in a way that you see you and your ministry team as God sees you, as sons and daughters of God with the the power of the Holy Spirit manifested in your life, you'll raise up lions who claim new territory for the Lord. Amen? Amen? Guys, I see before me an army. I was just asking the Lord to reveal your destiny to me tonight. 
The Lord was saying that there's going to be some people here tonight that he's calling to be missionaries in foreign lands. Specifically, I saw there are people being called to France and to Europe to reclaim lost territory for Jesus Christ and for his church. The Lord was saying there are people that are in this room who are being called to the Middle East to minister to the Muslim church and you're gonna see signs and wonders like never before that you're gonna walk with courage and confidence in who God has called you to be and the Muslim nations will come to an experience of the power and the presence of God. I saw in this room people, there's specifically a woman who is studying um, like pre-med or medicine and the Lord was saying that you're asking, am I in the right track? And the Lord is saying, oh, your feet are on the right path. That you're gonna bring an experience of revival to the medical field. The Lord was saying, some of you are, that there are gonna be healers that are like that rise up from this crowd. That you're going to go into new nations, not necessarily nations, but new territories. And you're going to start a revival of healing ministry and new universities where there have been no miracles of God, but you're going to start bringing the miracles of God to your place of influence. The Lord was saying specifically that there are people in this room who you're going to go into the business world. And a specific word that you have a family business And that you're the second generation of that family business and you're wondering, should I take over this family business because it hasn't been claimed for Jesus yet and I don't see my parents using it for the glory of God. And the Lord is saying, you're gonna take that business and you're gonna claim it for the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, I see in this room the potential for something more than a stadium. What the Lord's been saying to me for the last year is that revival doesn't come from stadiums filled with people answering an altar call because those have come and those have gone without revival. Revival doesn't even come through signs and wonders and healing miracles because those have come and those have gone without revival. But revival comes when a small group of people gather in a room together and they pray with one accord for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with lives totally surrendered to Jesus Christ. The greatest revival the world has ever seen happened with a small group of men and women in the upper room 2,000 years ago. It wasn't in a stadium. It wasn't broadcast on radios or on television networks. But it was an experience of men and women on their knees giving everything they had to the Lord because unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. Unless a follower of Jesus falls to the ground and dies, they, were just, they remain just a follower. But revivalist, missionaries, the world changers, there are those followers of Jesus that are crazy enough to fall on their knees and say, Lord, I give you everything. I throw this life away and I choose your life. I choose your promise. I'm going into battle no matter what because I believe in you. Okay, last point. The whole of the Old Testament is summarized by this. That God leads his people out of slavery into the promised land so they could find a land flowing with milk and honey. The fullness of the New Testament lies in this. That God leads his people out of a slavery to sin and to the false doctrines of this world into the promised land where rivers of living water flow. You guys want to know the full gospel? The land flowing with milk and honey? The land where rivers of life-giving water flow out of? It's you. 
It's the Christian filled with the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the promised land. The Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is pleased to dwell in me and in you. And those rivers of living water flow out of me. And that's why God can say to Joshua, every place your foot steps is the promised land. Because you carry the promised land to your family. You carry the promised land to your university. You carry the promised land to your friends and to the fallen followers of Christ and the atheists and the agnostics in this world. You are the promise of the Father for this time and for this season. And just like Joshua was called and chosen to lead his people into an experience of the more of God, today God says, I am calling you and I am choosing you to lead my faithless, lacking, like intimidated, grasshopper-minded people into the experience of the more. When we pray tonight, if you ask the Holy Spirit to come and wash over you, the promises of heaven flood you. Peace, love, joy, gentleness, generosity, faithfulness, kindness, patience, self-control. Lord, I pray tonight we wouldn't see grasshoppers. We would see temples of the Holy Spirit we would see tabernacles of God. We would see mighty warriors. And most of all, we would see followers of Jesus who are grains of wheat that have fallen to the ground and died to give you everything. Let's stand and worship.